I went to the liquor store and got me a fifth of Jack Daniels. I got my nine millimeter and I loaded it heavy because I was intending to kill everybody in that house. A strip club manager bent on revenge gets an ultimatum from God. I'm walking around with my glass of whiskey in my hand. I'm the boss man. I hear God say something to me you never want to hear God say. That and more on today's 700 Club Interactive. Well, welcome to the show. Here's Ephraim Graham with this week's top five stories from Studio Five. At number five. First and foremost, I thank my Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, for blessing me on this wonderful day. That's 52-year-old jockey Mike, Mike Smith, the oldest jockey to win the Triple Crown. And it was a very good beginning for Justify. Smith led Justify to become only the second undefeated horse to sweep the Kentucky Derby, Preakness, and Belmont Stakes. Justify is still there. Justify from Gronkowski. He's just perfect. And now he's just immortal. The Chestnut Colt finished almost two lengths ahead of second place. Extremely excited, very, very blessed, and I, I can't tell you, this, this is just amazing. At number four. Please join me in showing your love for the members of the Marjorie Stoneman Douglas High School Drama Department. 525,600 minutes. A surprise performance at this year's Tony Awards from the students of Marjorie Stoneman Douglas High School, honoring their teacher, Melody Hersfeld. Melody bravely sheltered 65 of her students in a small office for two hours until help arrived and led all of them to safety. She was given the Excellence in Theater Education Award, which includes a $10,000 prize for her school. This is absolutely a once in a lifetime. I was waiting for one of my students to be on the Tonys first. That's where they should be. That's who should be there first. It is very difficult to take all this positive attention when we always work really hard for everything that we do here. Um, we're very high achievers. So getting something for nothing doesn't set straight for us and getting something in light of a horrific event um, doesn't quite always feel right. But rest assured, I know that, I know personally getting a Tony Award nomination um, and uh, a theater education award is just not taken lightly. At number three. Hollywood shines the spotlight on faith and family with a new docu-series coming to TV One next week. Here's your first look at We Are the Campbells. It's important to me that I don't get so absorbed in my career that I forget that I'm still a mama and a wife. So I love doing radio from home because I get to still be a mom. Yes. Lord, I thank you. For the week ahead. The week ahead. <laughs> is the week of victory. The week of victory. Joining us right now is the first couple of gospel music, Warren and Erica Campbell. So we see from this clip, you guys are busy. Kids, careers. Yes. What made you say yes to returning to reality television. TV is an awesome opportunity to show an image that's positive with a healthy black family that loves God. It's really busy, but manages to kind of keep it together. I guess sometimes we keep it together, sometimes <laughs> we don't, but we're okay with both. We're okay, you know, when things fall apart, we have such strong faith in each other and in God that things will come back together. And I think it's healthy for people to see that. We're the Campbells premieres Tuesday, June 19th at 8 p.m. Eastern on TV One. At number two. I know something about you, don't you forget me. Academy Award winning actress Viola Davis's next role is behind the camera, producing the ABC docuseries, The Last Defense, taking a look at death row cases in the US. The docuseries is important so people can understand that it is not always fair. They need to be woken up to that. America cannot be great unless it's great for everyone until it works for everyone. The seven episodes of The Last Defense will focus on two death row inmates who claim they are innocent. At number one. God tapped me on my shoulder and he gave me, he told me he was giving me a gift. 12-year-old Demarge Smith delivers a new and inspiring message. He told me that this job won't be easy because I have to fight for what I want because what you want won't fight for you. This is hard work and dedication. Let me tell you, if you want an education, you have to go to school to learn knowledge, right? 
the young fitness guru has a huge online following. And he's attracted the attention of celebrities like Drake, Steph Curry, Pharrell, and Ellen. People, it's not 2017 anymore. It's 2018. We have to realize time is short. Time is ticking. Yes, there's going to be dream stealers along your journey who are going to try to steal your dream. But let me tell you what you do. You stay locked in, focused. You have tunnel vision. That means you don't see nothing else around you. Of course, there's going to be dream stealers beside you. But let me tell you, you put that hand up and say, uh-uh, dream stealers. <laughs> it's not happening. <laughs> I'm blocking you. Bye-bye. <laughs> Lamar J. Smith. Why? What, what started him on that? You know, his, his, his parents, he, he, he started uh, a YouTube channel, if, if you will. Um, but he was very inter interested in fitness. He was following books on Arnold Schwarzenegger and said this is something he wanted to do. Mom and dad saying, well, this is something you can do. So he began to, to, to work on physical fitness. And then, he, as you saw there, he said, God told them, I gave, you know, I have a dream for you. But, you know, you've got to work to make this happen. Uh, he is literally, as a result of, of having such a beautiful following online. I mean, millions of people are watching these videos. It's taken the attention of Ellen DeGeneres. She's made him a special correspondent on her show, so he goes to NBA events, uh, allowed him to meet Steph Curry, Kobe Bryant, uh, and all of them are inspired by this young kid's story and young people inspired by him. So he travels to schools and to just see all the kids excited. Uh, he talks about physical fitness. He talks about eating right, things that parents are trying to drive home. Now their oh. colleague, their young, young peer telling them, this is, this is how, you know, this you is how to do gonna it. going to be a preacher? I, I, I would not be surprised. <laughs> <laughs> I'd love to sit there for a sermon. He's got the, obviously. Got the delivery. <laughs> yes, and he, he, he obviously hears from God. At 12, he's listening. Very proud of that young man. And God's responding. Mm -hmm, indeed. All right. What's next? What do you want to talk about next? Well, ah, uh, let's. I guess let's begin with Mike Smith. <laughs> I, I was intrigued with his win, um, to, but then I wanted to know more about him. Mm -hmm. And then I learned that he was a high school dropout. <laughs> that he grew up in New Mexico, and literally, mom drops him off at school, <laughs> and he goes in one door and out the other to meet his uncle who then takes him his uncle trains horses so then his uncle takes him to spend time so with he, horses he grew up so, on the track. He, so he knew what he loved mom was certainly disappointed that he dropped out of high school as a result uh looking today though to see his great success he knew at a very young age this is what he wanted to do mm -hmm. and i was so impressed that the very first thing you say when someone puts a microphone in your mouth after a win is First and foremost, I want to thank my Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Make no mistake about it. I am where I am today because God allowed me to be here. Uh, hearing him say that, uh, and I managed to get his cell number. So I've been calling and calling and calling. I haven't gotten him yet, but I'm going to keep calling. <laughs> you want that exclusive? I want to talk yeah, to him. him. Yes. How what is he, 52? Is he, he is 52 years old, the oldest to win. Uh, yeah, Which 52. is... Um, you know, jockeys normally don't have a long career, and here he is, 52, and just Triple Crown is the ultimate the in ultimate. that sport. Yeah, I'm proud of him. Uh, awesome. So, Amazing yeah, man. I would love to hear the story. <laughs> and I'm pushing to get it journey, for you. Yes. How did he get there? You got it. And, yeah. Yeah, we want to know more. <laughs> for sure. <laughs> All right. Well, Viola Davis looking at death row. What, what's about? What's that all about? You know, I found that really intriguing because last week when we, were, we were talking here. We were talking about a, a gentleman uh, who had been on death row for 30 years uh, and then managed to to get free because yeah. an attorney believed in his story. Uh, and this is something that Viola Davis and her husband approached ABC with. They wanted to do a series on death row inmates. They started the first one this week. Um, they're going to divide it into two. They're looking at a mother in Texas who is on death row accused of killing her children. Her husband stands by her and says that she did not do it. He does not believe that. You hear the 911 call and they're gonna begin to then unfold this case in terms of how the prosecutors arrived at what what they've arrived at and what the defense is saying. And this is, as she said, you know, their last defense. This could very well be their last hope at getting free by shining a light on cases that the court systems may have forgotten, uh, and you don't know where else to go because we know that getting an appeal, the journey is long. And unfortunately, what we learn um, just by watching what we saw last night on there is a lot of it goes to 
you're not being able to financially come up with the money to defend yourself to to, to, to argue your case. Uh, so it'll be interesting to see how these fold out over the course of the, the next I eight weeks. I think most people don't understand that in the legal system. Yeah. And as a lawyer, I, I watched it. It's how much justice can you afford? Yeah. Um, and can you afford the experts and can you af afford the forensic? Mm -hmm. uh, once the police and a prosecutor have a theory and then they go about proving that theory, it's very hard to go against the resources of the state, the Absolutely. resources the state can bring. Uh, we talk a lot about public defenders, so mm -hmm. at least you have a lawyer. But um, if you don't have money for the expert, then you... It's very painful. I will say this. I was a supporter of capital punishment for a long time until I read uh, a book by someone on death row who was convicted of a crime he didn't commit. And then I got the chance to sit down with him and talk to him. And I was like, my eyes have been open. I had no clue. But I will say this, and he admitted, he goes, I may be guilty of many things. Mm -hmm. And I am not an innocent man, you know, by any stretch of the imagination. But the crime that they're accusing me of, the crime that they sentenced me to death for, is not something that I did. And it gets hard to prove when you've got a reputation that isn't necessarily the most stellar. You're just uh, the usual suspect. Yeah, absolutely. You're just <laughs> so the usual now. suspect, yeah. So you're, you, you're, you think we should get, a, get rid of capital punishment? I would like to not, yeah, I really it just, because for me, you know, I think of, you know, Jesus leaves the, the, the 99 to go after the one. If one life is lost and you are there for something you didn't do, I just, it just breaks my heart. Breaks my well, heart. Under the Old Testament, the accusers had to throw the first stones. I mean, they had to be the one, the witnesses against mm -hmm. um, the perpetrator yeah. of the crime or the ones that executed the sentence. We've gotten far away from that now. Absolutely. Yeah. And, uh, uh, 3,000, I think, on death row right now. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I, I think there's an economic ar argument there. Absolutely. The ca average capital case costs the, the taxpayers anywhere from one to three million uh, to prosecute. And um, is, it, is it worth it? Ah, don't think so. Okay. All right. All right. <laughs> I think they've wrapped us on time. All right, we, have okay. more, we have more to talk about, <laughs> yes, but we'll we, wrap. <laughs> once again, we got off on politics. For all the latest in entertainment news, I think that's what we were talking yes, about. Yes, yes. And politics, <laughs> you can check out Efren's weekly show, Studio 5. You can watch it online at cbn.com slash Studio 5. Up next, find out why this bully changed his life and how he's now making a difference in the lives of others. Stay with us. In Indonesia, a boy named Yuda once bullied the kids in his neighborhood. Now he's bringing them to church. He says it's all because of a lesson he learned while watching CBN's animated series, Superbook. Even at a young age, Yuda was becoming a bully. He often fought other kids or teased them, lots of times with help from his friends. I bullied them at school and also around my house. I tried to make them cry. Yuda had learned at home that fighting was the way his parents solved their problems. They usually fought about money. Yuda grew up in a secular home in Indonesia. His parents never attended mosque or church. Then one day, a Sunday school teacher invited Yuda and some other kids to visit her Sunday school class. Yuda remembers something he learned watching the CBN Superbook episode, In the Beginning. I saw Lucifer disobey God. I didn't want to be like Lucifer. Yuda's teacher invited the children to pray to receive Jesus as Savior. I prayed, Jesus, please come into my heart. I also asked God to please forgive me for fighting and being a bully to other kids. Yuda later invited his best friends to come and watch Superbook too. This is his teacher, Prisca. Not only Yuda has prayed to become a Christian, but his best friends prayed to receive Jesus too. And Prisca and Yuda's mother report that his behavior has radically changed. Now, he's praying for his parents to know Jesus too. I love Superbook because it helped me to stop being a bully. Thank you, Superbook. 
you want to take the stories of the Bible to the children of the world, join the Superbook Club. And for a gift of $25 or more, we'll send you the latest episode of Superbook, which is Superbook Explorer, where in there you'll have two episodes of Superbook plus a Bible background, uh, the archaeology of the episode, and then the theology of the episode. How does this story fit within God's plan of salvation? We'll send you not just one copy of it, we'll send you three copies. So if you want to share it with your friends, your, your family, uh, you can. Uh, and realize your gift will then go into the production costs, the distribution costs, the translation costs to take the stories of the Bible to the children of the world. We're up to now 53 languages uh, and we're, we're growing. We want to go even further with this uh, and so that all children everywhere have an opportunity to hear and see the stories of the Bible. You're a part of it when you join the Superbook Club. So do it now, 1-800-700-7000. Well, up next, his girlfriend betrayed him and he wanted revenge. I went to the liquor store and got me a pith of Jack Daniels. I got my nine millimeter and I loaded it heavy because I was intending to kill everybody in that house. Find out what stopped him right after this. As a teenager, Steve Waldrop was desperate for acceptance, so he made a deal with God. But Steve didn't keep up his end of the bargain. And years down the road, God called him to account. All I wanted was to be accepted by somebody when I was growing up. And to just to have, you know, a true friend and, and have somebody I knew that cared about me for who I was. Steve Waldrop was bullied for most of his childhood. I was really skinny. God blessed me with a big noggin and a big head, you know, and, and uh, kids would bully me and I, I, I got the name Jughead. I got beat up a lot. I got picked on a lot. At 14, Steve found acceptance when he gave his life to Christ at a summer camp. It gave me a sense of hope that Jesus truly loved me, that he didn't care if I was skinny or I was ugly or he loved me for me. But the bullying intensified and Steve spent more and more time alone. He was struggling to learn the guitar and asked God to help him. I said, God, if you'll teach me to play this guitar, to sing and to write songs, I'll do it for you, for your glory. And guess what? God said, let's do it. Because from that day, playing a guitar, it was like second nature to me. Soon after, a popular kid from school heard Steve playing the guitar. He was so impressed that he invited Steve to play at a party the following weekend. I felt accepted for the first time. Nobody was looking at me like this big-headed, ugly kid anymore. They were looking at me like, wow, we like the way you sing, we like the way you play, and you're part of us now. They were, they were paying attention to me. Steve drank his first beer and smoked his first joint that night. He continued to party with his new friends and then dropped out of high school in 10th grade to sing and play guitar at Honky Tonks. But I could always hear God keep telling me, this is not what you told me you'd do. This is not our deal. But see, the thing is, God didn't kill me. God didn't take that talent away from me. His deep voice caught the attention of a strip club owner who offered him a job as a DJ. Soon, Steve was running the place and several other clubs. At 22, he left music behind, but fell deeper into alcohol and drug abuse. Man, I had all the women I wanted, you know, all the cocaine I wanted, all the whiskey I wanted, all the money I wanted. I, I had everything I wanted. I didn't need God. Steve continued to live and work in the dark underbelly of strip clubs for the next 14 years. Then one night, a friend invited him over. When Steve arrived at the home, a man jumped him and beat him with a metal pipe. I remember seeing a darkness and feeling a loneliness. This loneliness and, and this feeling of, of nothing, no one, no anything. He woke up in a hospital with a doctor standing over him. He said, I'm not a religious man. He said, but I want to tell you this, somebody upstairs was looking out for you. He said, because 78% of the people that take a blow to the head like this don't live to tell about it. Steve learned an ex-girlfriend had set him up, and Steve left the hospital a few days later, set on revenge. 
I went to the liquor store and got me a fifth of Jack Daniels. I got my nine millimeter and I loaded it heavy because I was intending to kill everybody in that house. But en route to his ex-girlfriend's house, Steve was picked up for DUI and spent the night in jail. God really starts turning up the steam on me. God says, Steve, I love you. This is not the plans I have for your life. Steve's business partners bailed him out the next day and brought him to the club to let him cool off. I'm walking around with my glass of whiskey in my hand. I'm the boss man. I hear God say something to me you never want to hear God say. God says, Steve, it's now or never. I'm tired of playing with you. He fell to his knees in the middle of the club. Security gathered around me because they thought I was dying. They thought, surely, you know, this lifestyle is caught up with him. And I was on my knees saying, God, forgive me. Let me come home. I got up. I pushed everybody away from me. I went into the office of that club. I called the owner and I said, man, I quit. He started laughing. He said, why are you quitting? He said, you need more money. I said, no, man, I quit. And I said, I just gave my life back to Jesus. Steve was able to walk away from the clubs and the drugs, but he still wasn't free. The first place I went when I left there was to the liquor store and got me a bottle of Jack Daniels. And I went home and I prayed and I took a shot of Jack Daniels. I read my Bible and I took a shot. And I did that until I passed out. I woke up the next morning and I did the same thing. Steve tried everything he could to stop drinking, including several stints in rehab. He was only 38, but he knew he was dying. One day I was looking in my bathroom mirror and I looked in my eyes and I seen death. I told God, I said, don't let me die. Don't let me die. I'm back doing what you asked me to do. But I can't let go of this whiskey. I can't stop. And I figured it out. I fell on my knees. And I found the key to breaking those chains was I said, God, I cannot do this without you. And God be my witness. There's never another drop of whiskey touch my lips since that day. God immediately released me from that chain. He broke that chain. In 2013, he married Kelly, and today they travel the country, sharing a message of hope and second chances through Steve's music, just as he promised. It kind of gives you chill, man, to know that God will use an old strip club manager, someone that turned against him and never, ever stopped loving him. That's an awesome God. Finally, someone loved for who I was. There's that friend I was looking for. There's the one you've been looking for. And the story of the prodigal son is in the Bible for you and me to let us know that we can come home. Now for Steve, he went far, didn't he? I mean, he, he, he took the talent that God gave him and that got him into a strip club and then he went further into it. And he became a manager of it. And you heard him say he had everything that you know, the world offers. He, he had it all, but it wasn't enough and he had to continue to drink to fill up that emptiness inside. St. Augustine said it, that God has created a God-shaped hole in our hearts. King Solomon said he's put eternity in our hearts. And the only thing that can fill that is him. And until you have that relationship, until you know him, you'll never be satisfied. You can't fill it up. Only he can because we were made to have a relationship with him. Now, maybe you're like Steve, maybe you're a prodigal, and you made a commitment to Christ, you prayed that prayer, you felt his presence, and then for whatever reason, you ran away. You decided to do your own thing. 
Well, that story is for you. You can come to yourself and realize that he still loves you. He's not mad at you. All he wants is for you to be with him for all eternity. Now, some of you, maybe this is brand news that, you know, God's not keeping a tally up in heaven. Uh, he's, he's not mad at you. What he wants for you to do is to turn to receive him so that he can fill your life with good things. If you want this, all you have to do is ask for it. It's a very simple prayer. Jesus, could you forgive me? Could you bring me home again? Could you make me new? Could you forgive me? If you pray that with all of your heart, he'll answer. If you need help with that prayer, we're here for you. All you have to do is call us, 1-800-700-7000. Here's a word for you from Corinthians. Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, he is a new creation. Old things have passed away. 